It is 6.30. We're going to start our regular meeting of the Columbus, Wisconsin City Council. It is June 8th, 2021, and I want to welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. Our city clerk, Pat Gable, will now take the roll. All right. Here. Arnold. Here. Gray. Present. McCabe. Here. Motive. Present. Piperone. Here. And Reed is excused. If you are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this meeting has been noticed in accordance with state statutes and local ordinances, and I'm looking for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. All the paper will make a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Great seconds. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded. Any um, discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, Moving on to correspondence and communications, we do not have anyone signed up who wishes to speak tonight. So we will move on to the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I do have a couple of corrections. Okay. <laughs> it's per <pretty> usual. <laughs> um, item, item number seven on the Rudler um, Council uh, minutes. Trina Reed, it says it's claimed it's unanimous here. Uh, Trina Reed voted no against the uh, number seven. Okay. Oh, oh, that is correct. She did. Yeah. And then on the committee of the whole, uh, number one, again minor, but um, the meeting was called to order at six thirty. So was the other one. So did we clone ourselves? I guess not. <laughs> Okay, thank you, That's Paul. That's all I got. Um, do you want to amend the motion or make a motion with the <clears throat> corrections then? I will make a motion to approve the minutes with the corrections as noted. Oh, yeah, the whole. Right. <clears throat> I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the corrections noted in the minutes. Alder Gray will second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda with the uh, corrections as noted. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, the new, uh, then we're moving on to new business. I'm just going to hand this down to Paul. Um, the first uh, item on the new business is to appoint a weed commissioner. <laughs> uh, yes, this is a formality, but we do need uh, a person according to ordinance and state statute uh, that can uh, officially issue the notices uh, related to the weed and grass uh, uh, being too long. Uh, and uh, being as Dwayne Gao is serving as the interim public works director, I think it uh, might be appropriate just to appoint him until we have a replacement, at which point we could update that with a new person. Okay. So I'm looking for a motion to appoint Dwayne Gao as the uh, weed commissioner. Alder Motive will motion to make Dwayne Gao uh, interim weed commissioner. Okay, we'll second. So it has been moved and seconded to appoint Dwayne Gao as the uh, interim weed commissioner. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, the next item under new business is to consider and take possible action on resolution number 12-21, uh, resolution creating a tax incremental district number six, approving its project plan and establishing its boundaries. This is uh, regarding the um, downtown TIF district, which we have, the council in, in the past um, has been discussing since I believe December of 2020. And um, if there are any 
questions or issues um, about the? Uh, yeah, I think that would be good. Thank you, Matt. Good, uh, good evening. So uh, May 13th, we had a public hearing at the Plan Commission. Uh, it actually was fairly well attended uh, with a lot of comments. It, it should be noted that leading up to the meeting, I didn't really have any inquiries to look at the project plan or any questions on the TIF. Um, there was uh, several comments at the meeting, and then since then, it's kind of been the same as leading up to the meeting. There really haven't been any comments from the public to staff regarding the proposed TIF district. Um, at the TIF, uh, at the meeting, I, I think the biggest there weren't any um, people that spoke strongly in opposition of the TIF district. I think most people generally supported it. The largest um, discussion item, shall we say, was the boundaries of the TIF district. Um, and just, I just want to kind of cover a few of the items that came up. One is uh, 315 East James Street, which is probably better known as the Painted Crate. Um, it was suggested that the air, that area should be included in the TIF district. Um, you know, on, on closer look, uh, when we looked at it, at that area, uh, with its proximity to the second ward Creek and the mill pond, shoreland zoning would, have, would be in effect. And really it would make most of that site that would be kind of behind the painted crate kind of, there really wouldn't be much you could do. So it, it just, it, that area, you know, from a staff perspective does not, I, you know, I don't see the benefit of adding it at this time. Um, there was also several discussions about maybe some of the residential areas along Ludington being added. And I guess when we started the discussion with council, we weren't looking to add um, wide areas of residential um, areas. It, we were trying to keep it to, to the most, to the maximum extent practical commercial properties. So that's, that's why we didn't include that. The one area that's came up that may have some merit to being added into the TIF district is um, for the former GAR uh, plastic site over at 240 East, 240 East, North Birdsey, sorry, North Birdsey Street, that would be included in the TIF district. Um, there's some, some pluses and minuses to, it, it, you know, um, to doing, to, to um, delaying it, to incorporate that property. Um, I, I think from my perspective, I would prefer to see this move forward as soon as possible, but I, I am open for, I guess, uh, any questions and, and what council has, um, uh, questions council may have in regard to the TIF boundary. So I, I guess with that, and, and Greg Johnson is here tonight from Ellers to answer uh, any technical questions. The one thing, did, did you hand out the timeline yet? Uh, yes. mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. if we chose to add the um, add new properties to the TIF district. We'd have to go through and, and go through the notice process again. Basically what that means is we'd have to turn a notice into the paper. We'd have a, a second um, public hearing at Plan Commission. It would be July 8th. And then from there, uh, 14 days after that meeting, it could then come to council. I think the next meeting for council that it could come to would be August 3rd. And then I believe 14 days after that, it could go to the Joint Review Board. So it still would be approved um, in the, uh, I guess, 2020 year, or 2021 year when you look at uh, the, the TIF law. If, if you create the TIF before September 30th, then, you, then you're using the values at the beginning of 2021. If you create it after 930, then we're talking 1-1-2022. So I, I, think, I still think there's time to actually... Um, um, get the TIF amended within the 2021 TIF year. Um, and I really think that's, that's all I have for now. Um, I'm here for questions and Greg's here as well. So. Matt, um, just to clarify, uh, at the public hearing, there, there were some um, citizens who were concerned uh, because of their um, buildings or houses being within the district. Correct. And my understanding is that we can remove those buildings oh. without needing to Yes. Um, delay the process. Is that correct? Yes. So um, we, as long as the, the boundaries of the TIF district are still contiguous, um, we could remove properties uh, along Dickinson Boulevard and also next to the fire station if, if we chose to do so. 
and that would keep us on track. It's only if we add new properties that we have to start the notice period over. But since we've already noticed everybody about the um, proposed TIF district, if we remove properties, we can do that without the extra notice okay. and time. So. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, man, I guess, what, uh, can you tell me what you think the pros and cons would be with the plastic factory, whether adding it or not? Well, I, I think there's potential there for um, getting a, you know, giving some maybe incentive to get a, like a new user in there that would make some improvements to that area. Uh, potentially, you know, if somebody was interested, that may be a site that could be appropriate for redevelopment at some point as well. Um, I, I think with it being a two acre site uh, near the downtown, I think that's where having that site in the TIF district could be a, a benefit. I'm just curious, what was there a reason why it wasn't included with the At original? At the time when we were creating the TIF district, it was for sale, and I, I was I was very optimistic that the um, that the property would sell. And at the time, I, I thought it was going to sell. So kind of at the time, I thought there was going to be a good user going into that building. And there, there, it, it wouldn't really meet the but-for test because it just seemed like it was, um, they, they didn't need any assistance from the city to make it happen. So at the time, it just seemed like it, it didn't fit. So. I guess I'd hate to postpone this at all, but that might be a good property to put on it also. I don't know, just from... My perspective. The other thing, I guess, to, just to share, we can amend the TIF district up to four times. And when you look uh, it, surrounding the downtown area, um, there are really only a couple other logical places where we would go. So I, I, as staff, I wouldn't be concerned about exceeding the, the four amendment um, maximum. Uh, I, I just don't think we'd ever get there. So I, I, I also, you know, so I don't think there would be a harm if we, if we move forward because if there is a project there, we can always amend the TIF district for that project. Sir, Alder um, I, I believe that we should add Gar Plastics property now mm -hmm. and just go with the amended schedule. It's still gonna keep us in the 2021 year and it's only gonna delay things for a short amount of time. I also agree that we I think we should our, add Gar Plastics to the, the boundaries for the same reason. I want to make sure I, I'm clear, too, on, on the amendment process. If we move forward today without um, including GAR plastics right now, and then we get things rolling, and at some point, like next year, we decide we want to, then we amend the, the, uh, the uh, agreement. And um, does that mean we have to stop things or start over or what what does that mean by amending can no, you explain you, that you simply amend the project plan and i'll this is where i'll let greg chime in because he's gonna do a better job explaining it than you. so if you decide to add another parcel now really all you're doing is delaying the creation of this district you're not amending the plan as it's defined under statute okay. and the reason you have to kind of go back and do a public hearing is, as matt mentioned is since this is a rehabilitation TID district, you're required to send a letter to every property within the proposed district informing them that there's a public hearing. That's a statutory requirement to create a rehabilitation district. That's not a requirement for all types of TIF districts, but it is for this type of district. So if you decide to add more parcels, we just need to go back and repeat steps that were taken previously. So the district would just be created with a different boundary. So what the alternative is, if you go ahead with the current boundary and then you decide later you want to add territory, that's called an amendment. And as Matt mentioned, you get up to four territory amendments over the life of a district. Um, so then you still have to go through the same process to create a district as you do to amend it. There'd have to be a public hearing, action by the Common Council, and approval by the Joint Review Board. So. Um, it's that's really kind of the the issues at stake is that if you decide to make some changes to the boundary we can still do that we just have to go back and repeat the public hearing and bring it back uh, to council so when you do an amendment you're not like putting things on hold or halting what what you've already started no an, an amendment occurs once a district is already created okay. so what we're talking about here is still creating a district 
just adjusting the boundaries. So if you decide tonight you want to add additional property, you're not going to take action to create this district. The direction is going to be, let's go back, schedule another public hearing, and bring the creation back to the council at a later date. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Ian, I'm Alder I, Grave. <laughs> I would just like to say I, um, I would like to move forward with the district right away and amend it later. Um, like Matt was alluding to, there aren't very many other properties that we would potentially include to amend later. So it's not going, we're not going to run into an issue of having too many amendments and not being able to do this. This gets us off and running faster and helping our community faster. And I just don't see the purpose of going back and starting this process over and delaying anything since it's much faster and easier to just add it later if it becomes something that should be added. It may not even be a property that we want to add later, you know, so there's just really not a good reason to delay for now. Oh, okay, for one, um, I too agree that um, we should add GAR, but I concur with Ian Gray, Alderman Gray, sorry, um, following your suit, um, to move ahead with this, get it rolling, and then we can do it at a later date. Just, you know, we get the same result. Thank you. Any, does anyone? Uh, I, I would agree. I would agree with that also. I'd like to keep the momentum going. I'm fine with keeping the momentum going, but I'd like a clear understanding of how quickly we could consider the amendment to add GAR plastic since there seems to be considerable interest among some of the members. The amendment can occur as soon as the TID district is created. So if uh, the Common Council passes the resolution that's on your agenda tonight to create the district, uh, the final step in the creation process is consideration by the Joint Review Board, which consists of all the other taxing jurisdictions, so the city has representation on that board, and then there's a public member. Uh, and so that meeting is scheduled to occur in a couple of weeks if, if you decide to move forward this evening. So as soon as that district is created, you can amend it then at any time going forward. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions? Okay. So at this point, I think I am looking for a motion. <laughs> Alder Gray will move to adopt resolution 1221, creating the tax, and, uh, tax incremental district number six and approving the project plan and its boundaries. Alder Pine from the second tab. So we have a, uh, a motion and a second to um, consider or to approve uh, taking action on resolution 1221. Um, and we should do a roll call. <laughs> Gray? Aye. McCabe? Aye. Mora? Aye. Piperone? Aye. Albright? Aye. Motion carries. Motion. Motion passes. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, item number four under new business is to consider and take action on resolution 13-21 authorizing. Oops, I'm sorry. Did I miss one? Yes. Did I miss? Yes, I missed um, the tax. Okay, sorry. I'm going back to number three. We did number two. Now we're doing number three, which is consider and take action on tax increment finance district six timeline and project plan. <laughs> for oh I mean, so okay I was just chatting with with Greg about the timeline and uh, essentially there will be a notice going to the paper tomorrow for the joint review board uh, the joint review board will meet uh, June 21st at 10 a.m. here at City Hall um, and uh, once the joint review board takes action uh, I believe Ellers I get, um, will take some, uh, I guess I wish I kept Greg around for this. Um, um, uh, Ellers will basically uh, submit the project plan to DOR, Department of Revenue, for final review and certification of the TIP district. Okay. I, 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 now that, yeah, now that we're at this point, I think it's fairly simple just to, to move forward and, and have the joint review board meeting and certify the TIP district. 
Does anyone have any questions? Shelley, do you have a? Okay, I saw your microphone was on, so I thought. Oh, is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> anyone uh, have any questions for Matt? Okay. So I am looking for a motion to consider and take action on the tax increment finance district six timeline and project plan. Alder Gray will move to approve the tax on tax increment district number six uh, timeline and project plan. Alder Motive will second. So it has been moved and seconded to um, approve the tax increment finance district six timeline and project plan. And uh, I'm assuming we want to do a roll call on this also. Okay. Gray. Aye. McCabe. Aye. Motive. Aye. Piperone. Aye. Albright. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now to number four, which is consider and take action on resolution 13-21, authorizing execution of the DNR principal forgiven financial assistance agreement. <laughs> and do we have someone? Uh, did you want to talk, address that? I don't know if there's anything further to explain. It's, other, it's a resolution that needs to be adopted so that we can submit to the DNR and then go forward with the process for uh, lead lateral uh, replacements. I'm sorry, for, for lead lateral? Lead lateral. Okay, just for those of us who don't know what that means, what does okay. that mean? <laughs> a, it, uh, that's for private side uh, water services that are lead. Okay. All right. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for... Mr. Hammer, or any uh, issues or anything? Okay, thank you so much. I'm hoping th this is going to, last time it was a three year process. Now they're going forward with annual, okay. so we have to reapply annually. I'm hoping that they don't decide to do a rewrite annually so that we have to go through this process annually. So, uh, well, fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am now looking for a Excuse motion. Me, uh, oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sir. I have a question before we move forward. I, I think I need to recuse myself from this one. This is goes along with that grant. Yes, this would be related to that grant, and I think at the Committee of the Whole, you did recuse yourself, so this would be appropriate now as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so I am looking for a motion to consider and take action on this resolution. McCabe will make a motion to pass Resolution 1321, authorizing execution of the Department of Natural Resources Principal Forgiven Financial Assistance Agreement. All the pipe will second that. So it has been moved and seconded to move forward on Resolution 1321. Uh, is, do we need to, do we want to take a roll call on this or? Nah, probably not. Okay. So um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? So the motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, and the next issue on the agenda, or the next item on the agenda is number five, to consider and take action on request for Highway 89 encroachment agreement. And I know we have discussed this in the past. Um, does uh, anyone have any questions about this? As Matt, I'm sure, can answer if anyone has any, <laughs> any discussion. Okay. Hearing none, how about a motion? Or do you want it? Do you want a minute to just make sure you know what we're talking about? Um, I can give a quick recap, too. So this is the... Uh, uh, kind of a stone building uh, next to the Kurth Brewing Company. And through the work in preparation for Highway 89, they discovered that it's, uh, I think, 0.4 feet into the right-of-way. Uh, this agreement is a little bit different than the standard, um, but will allow the building, obviously, to remain where it is unless at some point we would uh, need uh, that or the building would be destroyed or something. Uh, the risk to the city is that uh, the components of the agreement that typically... Um, obligate the property owner to remove the building or the debris 
uh, from the right of way at their own expense are not in here. Um, so that would be the only thing is we would have to address that if that ever became an issue. But there's other uh, methods that we can use to uh, assess against the individual property if that was an issue. So um, this was recommended for approval by the city attorney. Okay. Thank you very much. And anyone have any questions? So then I am looking for a motion. Alder Gray will move to approve the encroachment agreement, the Highway 89 encroachment agreement with um, the property located at 130 Farnham Street. All the pipe from will second that. It has been moved and seconded that we uh, approve the request um, to take action on the Highway 89 encroachment agreement. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Um, the next item is uh, number six, is to consider and take action on the plan commission recommendation regarding the application of ACS RBHS uh, LLC for a zoning map amendment for parcel number 11211-1505.64 and 11211-1505.65 from uh, RD Rural Development to R3. Um, and the information is in your packet. This was information um, that we went over at our last meeting, um, proposal from uh, Steve Black and James Hartung. So is there any uh, further discussion or any questions about this uh, item? Okay, any, any questions or anything? Okay, any? Seeing no need for discussion, I'm looking for a motion. Alder Gray will move to approve the zoning map amendments for the parcels named um, for ACS, RBH, SLLC. Alder Modif will second. It has been moved and seconded that uh, we approve this uh, plan commission recommendation all those in favor, please signify. Oh, signify by saying aye. <laughs> aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, and then item number eight is uh, a, I'm, oh, number seven. Oh, okay, that's right, we have three of these. So number seven is uh, to consider and take action on the plan commission recommendation regarding an application from the same group, ACSRBHS, LLC for the proposed uh, certified survey map for parcel one, you know, is this, okay. Okay. Did we, I thought we had done yeah, this, this one. one this one was done already, I think. <laughs> oh. Okay. And then this is the CS, so there's two separate CSMs, one for Lot 64, which is the, this property. Okay. Which is 1121, 1505, 54, and the next one for 1505, 65. Okay. So this is the application yes, from? Approving the CSM this time. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I get sort of lost in all the initials and the numbers. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So, any discussion on this or any questions? Uh, hearing none, uh, I'm looking for a motion. Alder Piper will make a motion to approve the application from ACS RBHS LLC for the proposed certified survey map for parcel number 11211-1505.64. Gray will second. So it has been moved and seconded that we approve the plan commission recommend recommendation regarding this parcel. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Now we'll move on to number eight, <laughs> which is 
Uh, consider and take action on plan commission recommendation regarding application from ACS RBHS LLC for the proposed certified survey map for parcel number 1121-1505.65. So uh, again, the same group is looking for our approval to move ahead and I am looking for a motion. Um, Alder Albright will make a motion to recommend the regarding the application from ACS RBH LLC for the proposed certified survey map for parcel 11211-1505.65. Okay, seconds. And okay, thank you. We have a we uh, have a motion and a second to um, approve the plan commission recommendation regarding uh, this application. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay, none. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. And the next item, number nine, consider and take action on the plan commission recommendation to adopt the Columbus 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Okay. Is, are there any questions, any discussion? Matt, do you want to fill us in? This has been talked about for a while, and uh, it's gone through plan commission, and uh, there haven't been any comments. Um, so if I am here for any questions, and. Matt, I do have a question. Sure. So I went through, I went through both of them, sort of. Um, I see that there's significant changes between the, the 2030 and the 2040. Can you just give us a quick sum up of what, what's different? Or um, is that too complicated? Uh, no, to well, I mean, I guess, I mean, significant changes in what areas, I guess? So... I mean, I would say the land use, the, the future land use map is, is still fairly similar where the areas kind of um, without direct access off the 151 are still going to be more your retail uh, or your retail residential areas mm -hmm. the areas um, that are still undeveloped that are off the highway interchanges that's going to be a mix of office retail commercial and industrial type uses right so you're changing stuff the way i remember it i don't have the maps in front of me but mm -hmm. i remember there's a lot of, lot more green space in the 2030 map like around the city or whatever and i see that you're we're turning that into mixed use right is that am i understanding that correctly uh, i guess i'm not i guess i i i'm not saying i'm not saying you do, you're not understanding it correctly i guess i'm not I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Okay, I, just, so I, I guess I'd need to sit down and discuss that. With, okay, so then I guess better. maybe a better way to say it is there is a lot of agricultural land on the 2030 map that has been switched to mixed use. So I guess what I'm asking, is there any more area around Columbus that we're mm -hmm. anticipating to build on rather than have it uh, cited as well the, the the area kind of um, I'd say from the edge of the built environment in town right now basically to the highway for the next 20 years I, I think for the residential area that's kind of the the um, the area that we're looking towards so is that uh, over by Emmerpack and the hospital well, no kind of going you know if you, you going out uh, where the CSM is actually that that just got approved out in that area um, so going Sturgis um, oh, okay. South of Maple, kind of north of Western, that that area out in there okay. is is kind of the area that's been targeted for residential. There are also some areas on the south side of town near Kessel Ridge that um, could be further developed. I think there's about 40 acres down okay, there. Okay, and that, that might have been the part that I noticed because I'm close to that area okay. or whatever. Okay. Um, and you know, and then it, really, as I said, the the areas off the highway interchanges. So you're talking the. The 16, which is kind of right now our main commercial corridor, really, that's where a lot of it is located. It, you know, it, the undeveloped areas in like Commerce Center and further out, we, we um, you know, like maybe the Niehoff parcel, we expect to see some sort of uh, commercial growth there. Then also, obviously, both um, down on the 73 interchange, where Interpac is now 
um, we'd expect to see kind of a mix of commercial type uses, whether it's some office, industrial, and retail. Okay. And, and some multifamily kind of not on the frontage areas where you're trying to fit in and kind of have some sort of, I guess, transition from a commercial area to a residential area. So. Anyone else have any questions for Matt? Okay. So I am looking for a motion. Alder oh. Gray will move to adopt the Columbus 2040 comprehensive plan. All the pride from will second that. So it has been uh, moved and seconded to approve the uh, plan commission recommendation to adopt the Columbus 24 comprehensive plan. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? I'm, I'm not ready to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you, Being new, I'm just not ready to make a vote on this. So are you voting no? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the, the motion passes and, okay. Um, so the next item is to consider and take action on potential update to the Columbus Outdoor Recreation Plan to gain eligibility for stewardship and land and water conservation fund grants. And um, there's some information in our packet. And uh, no. <laughs> that would be, I was looking right at Amy Jo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, this, this right. But the, the one, I, I don't want to say catch, but the one caveat was that we actually had to update our outdoor rec plan. So as I mentioned at the cow at the 18th, um, we have a draft that was done previously that's in a word format that I can update. And over the summer, I'm planning to update that document and then have it adopted so we can be considered for this other grant. Okay. And the other grant just, just to clarify, is to help with the real estate acquisitions for the uh, program that was approved by the TAP grant. So the, so the TAP grant that we received last year, um, part, of, part of the project is acquiring real estate for recreational bike and pedestrian trails. So And TAP stands for? Transportation Alternatives Program. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry, I, I speak in acronyms. <laughs> So is there any, are there any questions or any discussion on this item? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I am looking for a motion. Alder Gray will move to approve updating the Columbus Outdoor Recreation Plan. So it has been moved and seconded to update the Columbus Outdoor Recreation Plan. Um, and uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next item, number 11, is to consider and take action on the May Ward Fund application for flowering baskets. So I'll update this one too uh, briefly. Uh, so this did go to co the cow on the 18th uh, with the school um, being done for the year. Obviously, they couldn't keep them at the greenhouse, so they went up, I, I think, just before Mor Memorial Day. So technically before it went through the final process, but with the support on the 18th, I didn't think there would be too much of concern with moving forward with that. So this just needs the, I guess, final blessing here tonight. Okay. Any questions for Matt on the flowering baskets? So they're up now. I have yes. to go make a point of looking at them. I'm sure they're very nice. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Well, great. So now I am looking for a motion. Alder Albright can make a motion for the May Ward Fund application for flowering baskets. 
Alder Mona will second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we approve the May Ward Fund application for flowering baskets. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, um, the next item, number 12, is to consider and take action on request to transfer assets from the DPW to the fire department, and um, this is regarding the copy machine that we talked about um, at our last meeting. Uh, information's in the packet, and does anyone have any questions on this plan? Mike, you have your, but you don't have, do you have a question? My bad. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, um, any discussion? Looks like there's none, uh, so I'm looking for a motion. McCabe will make a motion to transfer the copy machine from DPW to the fire department. Do I have a second? Alder Motive will second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to approve the request to transfer assets from DPW to the fire department. Uh, the next item is oh, to, oops, I'm sorry. Oh. What? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just assumed everybody was going <laughs> to say something. Got a little ahead of myself there. I guess uh, not that I'm psychic or anything, but all those in favor, <laughs> please, please aye. say aye. aye. Anybody opposed? Thanks for keeping me on the straight and narrow there. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, the next item is to consider and take action on the part-time position proposed by the Cable Commission. And uh, information, again, was in your packet. Um, Kyle, I, do you want to? Sure, just a quick update. Uh, I, I do have um, an updated version that I discussed with the Cable Commission last week. Uh, very minor changes, uh, they're highlighted in red on your copy, uh, classifying the FLSA uh, correctly, um, adding uh, one sentence under the essential duties and responsibilities that would allow the position to create promotional materials uh, in coordination with the media coordinator and other city officials. And just to be clear, that's intended to supplement the recordings that they're already doing, not to be extra other unrelated work. Um, and then the work environment uh, uh, just added that it might be noisy anticipating this position might be going out in the field and catching concerts in the park or other louder community events uh, so just making sure we're kind of covered for uh, the environment and uh, there was no objections at the cable commission okay thank you uh, any questions I do have a question yes. um, can you refresh my was it like 12 hours a month that we were anticipating this position was going to be working it is approximately 100 hours a year at $12 an hour and this would be a hundred percent funded out of the cable commission budget. okay so is there any because I just was looking at the the position description and I was wondering there's like a lot of work here and I'm wondering is there any wiggle room for that person if they end up doing like concerts in the park or like some something over at the library is that going to be accounted for or is this pretty a hundred hours and that's it um, I anticipate the media coordinator uh, would really be kind of balancing their time. Okay. The, the goal, I think, is to keep your media coordinator focused on the high-value tasks, and then uh, not that taping this meeting it isn't uh, exciting Obviously, and important, right. <laughs> but you know, trying to reserve these kind of duties for the part-time. So um, you know, I think if this position works out really well, I could see it expand in the future to a, a larger part-time role. Um, but it's really going to be, I think, directed by the media coordinator. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about the position? Okay, then I am looking for a motion. Alder Gray will move to approve the part-time position of the production specialist. Okay, seconds. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to approve the part-time position proposed by the Cable Commission. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Uh, moving on to number 14, consider and take action on bids to remove ash trees for the DNR forestry grant. And uh, again, I, this was the information's in your packet and was discussed before. Um, are there any questions about this item? Okay. 
or any discussion? Anybody? Okay. So um, I'm looking for a motion to take action on the bids. McCabe will make a motion to approve and award the city ash tree removal contract to K and B tree and lawn care. Um, Mike, I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing you. Could you, um, could you say that again, please? Uh, make a motion to award this city ash tree removal contract to K and B tree and lawn care. Gray will second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. Um, it has been moved and seconded uh, uh, to um, remove the ash trees as uh, noted. Um, all those in favor? Or do we, uh, we better do a roll call. Okay, we'll do a roll call for this one. Okay. McCabe? Aye. Mora? Aye. Piperone? Aye. Albright? Aye. Gray? Aye. Motion carries. Great, thank you so much. Um, then uh, number 15 is to consider and take action on claims in the amount of $343,297.25. And again, all that uh, information was in your packet. Are there any questions? It, it seemed a little high this month and I was noticing um, there's a couple larger costs, but one of them is the Safe Built LLC. What is that? Uh, so that is uh, Safe Built is our contract building inspector. Uh, it's a very high number. Uh, the fortunate part is that's only 80% of the money we took in, which means we kept the 20% of whatever you know is remaining. So uh, high building uh, permits, and there's some multi-million dollar building projects going on at the school, and so that generates a lot of fees for them, a lot of inspection work as well. But uh, that was a much higher number than normal. Anyone else have any questions about uh, the claims from through June 1st? Okay. Um, I am looking for a motion. Alder Pipefrom will make a motion to approve the claims in the amount of $343,297.25. Alder Modic will second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded to approve the claims presented in the amount of uh, so noted. And uh, we'll do a roll call on this one also, I guess. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mora? Aye. Piperone? Aye. Albright? Aye. Gray? Aye. McCabe? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next item is the report by city officers, um, city administrator and mayor. Well, like, you can go first, Kyle. <laughs> All right, sounds good, thank you. Uh, a, a few things tonight, uh, a little longer than normal, but um, I wanted to let everyone know I did meet with uh, the Department of Transportation last week and the city engineer and water and light regarding the Highway 89 plans. Uh, they're nearly finalized, they're calling them 90% uh, plans, and it looks like construction's still obviously on track for next year. Um, there's a few loose ends that we'll be tying up here in the coming months uh, regarding some tree removals and things like that that the state would like the city to do and then they'll credit us uh, those expenses on the um, on the project. Um, also, we did uh, complete the interviews for the finance director and public works director and we're still making you know progress on those and I hope to have uh, more to report on those relatively soon. Um, and in a related note, uh, you know, I wanted to mention that all of the existing staff uh, with all the vacancies, they've been doing a great job kind of filling in and managing the workload, you know, especially DPW, this is, this is prime time for them. Uh, everything's growing, all the fields are in use, uh, so there's a lot of work to go around. Um, but yeah, I think from recreation to DPW to wastewater, uh, City Hall, Police Department, everyone's really kind of picking up the slack. And I just wanted to, you know, publicly thank them and say thank you. Um, in a, a related note, um, with more good news, um, the Recreation Department is really in full swing now that summer is uh, rolling on and the heat is here. Um, uh, tennis lessons started today, and so you'll see those several days a week uh, for the 10 and under group was today, uh, or actually yesterday, I believe, and then uh, the older group started today. Uh, the summer day camp also started up. That's running smoothly already, and uh, Amy Jo's staff 
are uh, doing their best to keep everyone busy, active, and cool. Apparently, the uh, the freezy pop treats were a very big hit today, <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's encouraging. Uh, some things never change, I guess. Um, and then the the camp is being held at the Rest Haven, and uh, the younger Pee Wee group is held late morning, and the uh, older Youth Adventure Camp is in the afternoon. And uh, these camps are sort of the chance to get together uh, with the kids in, in, the, in the group setting and do science projects and sports and crafts and explore the parks. Uh, so uh, sort of a, a popular uh, program over the years and it looks like it's continuing on uh, this year as well. Uh, and then finally with the warm weather, uh, the pool is now open. And I know uh, I was over at the pool this weekend and so were a lot of other people. Uh, with the, the warm weather, it's just really nice uh, to see it open. Over the weekend, they had a soft opening to kind of ease the new staff in, and uh, it was a very busy but very successful weekend. I think they ended up doing quite a bit of sales, and they had a, a really high capacity, so I think that um, that was wonderful. And then, uh, so now we're on the normal cool hours, uh, so normal operating hours are Monday through Friday, noon to 4, uh, with an evening swim from 6 to 8.30, so you can still probably make it, depending. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday from noon to 8.30. Uh, and then all those information and hours, you can find it on the city website and the Aquatic Center Facebook page as well. Um, and then uh, sort of as a final note, Amy Jo wanted to give a shout out to Kane, who manages the Aquatic Center, uh, for all the hard work that he's put in at the pool. Um, obviously, just coordinating all the uh, opening of the pool and getting everything set, plus training all the new staff, it's uh, a tremendous amount of work. And uh, with Kane doing all that work, he's even coaching the swim team on top of that. So uh, Amy Jo just wanted to make sure that we gave him a, a, a shout out and we're really lucky to have him and I concur with that. So uh, Indiana, on a, a good positive note, but uh, great things to look forward to this summer. Thank you, Kyle. And I, I guess on a personal note, I, I want to say that I think we're so lucky in Columbus to have the parks and recreation programs that we have. Um, our aquatic center is just fabulous. And um, I also a little personal note here, my daughter taught tennis um, for Amy Jo for a few years. And this summer we dropped her off in New York and she's teaching at a camp and really enjoying it. So yeah, we're, we're very lucky and thank you for everything that you do. Um, my report's kind of short this week. I was gone for a week, and so I don't have that much to tell you about. Uh, just to remind you that the farmer's market is happening tomorrow, and they are having strawberries. So uh, you may want to get there early. Um, it's at 150 North Ludington Street, right downtown, and uh, lots of uh, interesting vendors. They are apparently going to be there every Wednesday. And, you know, I forgot to write. Oh, 3 to 6, 3 to 6, every Wednesday um, during the summer and into the fall. Uh, they do have a Facebook page. So if you Google it, you will find it, and you can get some more information by going to their Facebook page. Um, we uh, want to remind you that our June dates have changed for our council meetings because um, next Tuesday is a primary for the 37th Assembly District. Um, that'll be held on June 15th. And there are a lot of candidates, uh, so um, don't forget to go and vote. And then the actual election for the 37th Assembly District will be happening on July 13th. And this is a special election because our former um, assembly representative was elected to replace our former state senator. So Senator John Jagler's seat is now open in the assembly. Um, so don't forget to vote. And uh, 4th of July is coming. Um, oh, and I was going to hold this up. We got the booklets today. So um, this will tell you everything you need to know about the Columbus 4th of July. And they also have, uh, if you Google them, they have a uh, website or a Facebook page so you can get more information about the uh, festivities on the 4th. Um, remember to put on sunscreen and to keep hydrated. Uh, next week, on Monday, we are going to be uh, swearing in the new police chief, uh, police lieutenant. Is that right? Did I get that right? Uh, at 9 o'clock on Monday morning, and I want to congratulate him and uh, the department. And that is it for me. Okay. 
So I think that's it then. We need a motion to adjourn. Alder Pfeiffer will make a motion to adjourn. Alder Model will second. It has been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.
Here. And Reed is excused. Perfect. Well, and the meeting has been noticed as an open meeting. And so next up is to approve the agenda. Does any? All the pipe firm will make a motion to approve the agenda as is. Okay, second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Perfect. All right. So, uh, city citizen comments. Is there anybody here? I don't see anyone that signed up. John, I assume you'll want to talk during the actual moments, not beforehand. So, no, okay. Perfect. Then let's move on. We have number five. We have the committee and commission minutes from the CDA from 2:22 and 3:15 the CHLPC from 4.8, the CWL from 4.15, the PFC from 4.13, the Plan Commission from 2.11 and 3.11, and Tourism from 2.2. Anybody, any questions, comments on those? Nothing, perfect. Moving right along. And so, next up on our agenda, um, we need to uh, discuss the assessor error as a palpable error for parcel 11211. 1087.02, and Kyle's going to give us some more info on that. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of those, uh, I guess, sort of routine issues that happens over time when the assessor makes an error. Um, there's a process by which we can uh, issue the refund to the taxpayer because they were improperly taxed. They should not have been taxed based on an error. Uh, so we have to give them the refund up front. And because obviously we collect for all those other jurisdictions, um, we're paying money that we never actually received because it went off to the school and the tech school and the county. Uh, there's the process uh, by doing this, we file with Department of Revenue. Eventually next year, I believe we get our money back from those other jurisdictions. Um, and this is uh, the type of error. This isn't uh, a dispute on the value or a judgment issue. This is uh, something where I believe this one was a land value adjustment, uh, but this is the sort of thing uh, like when a house is raised and they forget to take it off the tax bill and you pay taxes on something that clearly didn't exist anymore. So um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts um, of that, but I, I'll try to answer any questions uh, that I can. Does anyone have any questions for Kyle on it? It's fairly straightforward, just a process that we need to undergo. Perfect. Good to move that forward then. Um, and let's see here. So number seven. Uh, review and discuss the upcoming compliance maintenance annual report um, for the wastewater treatment facility. And we have Katie here to talk to us a little bit about that. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just uh, here is kind of a memo that's this is coming up. Uh, it, it is due this compliance maintenance annual report is due June 30th. Um, it is an annual report that uh, it's, the, it's called CMAR, is a self-evaluation tool that promotes the owner's awareness and responsibility for wastewater collection and treatment needs. It measures the performance of the wastewater treatment. It works during, the wastewater treatment works during a calendar year and assesses the level of compliance with the permit requirements. Basically what it is, it's a full report of everything that happened in 2020. Um, it gives you um, the ability to review, and then it requires the council to approve it before uh, we send it to the DNR on June 30th. So it is nearing completion. I still have to meet with finance to finish off the financial end of it, but it's very close to complete and will be complete for the council on the 22nd. Perfect. Thank you so Thank you. much. So basically, she just needs permission to get the report and move it to the next meeting so we can approve it. Is there any questions? Or? No. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. And then, so next we have, did you want to start with everything, John? Or no. I don't know who all wants to talk. You can go ahead and come up. Um, so we have John Salzweedle here from the CHLPC, and he's going to talk to us a bit about um, remodeling the Rest Haven restroom. Let's see here. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm John Salzweedle. I'm here as a representative of Columbus Historic Landmarks and Preservation Commission. Um, on your uh, agenda here, you see that we'd like to uh, uh, we'd like to 
uh, do some some work on the Rest Haven bathrooms. Uh, currently, we have a pretty sizable pool. Uh, I'll just say we have we have thirty thousand dollars right now, and we have some interested um, donors uh, who would like to see this project completed to its fruition. Um, I can say that there's somebody who has a potential fifty thousand dollar donation, um, but it kind of hinges on the buy-in from the council here. So um, what we'd like to do is have some architectural drawings done and uh, get a cost estimate for this project. Um, I, additionally, I'd like to uh, ask the council about uh, when we look for an architect, if we could include uh, Alder Pyfron to submit work to CHLPC. Um, prior to his public service, he had presented some some work that he's done as an architect, and uh, we we really like that for the the entryway design. Um, it's it's my feeling that uh, public servitude shouldn't impede anybody from the chance to to work uh, in their community and submit a bid. So that's that's about all I have on that right now. If you have any questions, let them rip. Awesome. <laughs> So basically what John is saying, they want permission to like start the process. So there's not like specific plans on exactly what's gonna happen. They just wanna get it going, get architects involved. Everybody okay with moving that forward to the next meeting? We're, uh, right. Yeah, right. And we're just passing out some pictures of the current condition of the Rest Haven uh, bathrooms there. There's an, a, lot of, a lot of need um, of repair. There's also, um, there used to be showers in that, that building, which we don't really have any intention of putting showers in there, but there's additional space for maybe future expansion of those bathrooms and ADA uh, compliance. Awesome. Yeah, I think we, everyone probably had some pictures of, they, yeah. Yeah. they are in some definite need of yeah, yeah. updates. So. Uh, just to mention the other thing I think that HLPC would be looking for tonight would be Basically, you know, moving this forward is also kind of giving your blessing that they're going to start incurring costs. Mm -hmm. And so if there's any concerns about wanting to support the project moving forward, now would be the time to, you know, kind of give them the direction on not that interested or very interested because once they start incurring costs, those are substantial. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if there are reservations, now would be the time versus when they come back for final approval. Right. No. Still, everybody's still good. It needs to be done, right? And, and the CHLPC is doing a great job and stepping up to do it for us. So awesome. Thank you so much for that. And then straight on to um, number nine, um, uh, the CHLPC is requesting to apply for uh, state grants. Yeah, okay. Um, so I got an email from Jason Tish, who's our contact uh, person from the State Historical Society. And he is reaching out to uh, all of the certified local governments about uh, potential for a grant up to, I believe it was $50,000. Um, now, initially, when I heard that, I thought this would be great. We could put that towards that entryway. However, it's not a bricks and mortar type of uh, grant. So it's more of an informational um, type of grant. So uh, I talked a bit on the phone with uh, Matt, was it earlier in the week or last week, I suppose? Sorry, it was last week. Um, but I think that a, a good uh, idea for that for uh, historic preservation would, would be to have um, some sort of, uh, I guess I'd call it like a, a pamphlet or some sort of a document or a book um, that would kind of spell out what the criteria is that we're looking for, for our, um, our which we're going to get to next, the uh, um, facade grant program how we could kind of tie that into that so that there's some materials available um, looking at what we need to see, kind of a punch list or a how-to to fulfill that um, for the facade grant program. Uh, additionally, if there would be other, other money left over from a potential grant, I was just kind of spitballing an idea here, but I thought it might be cool to have like a, a virtual walking tour something that we could have on the city website of the historic districts or historic properties. Awesome. I like that. And I, 
I know there's been confusion of which buildings and properties are landmarks and designated things, and this grant could afford some funds to help clear that up and get things of that nature yeah, going as perhaps. well. So that would benefit the city too. So lots of good things, and grant money is always awesome. Does anybody yes. have? And grant this money. one, um, to point out, there isn't a required match from the city. So the city would not have to put forward anything in addition to this. So that's, that's a big thing to say as well. But any questions or comments or anything for John on the CLG grant? John, do you need the city to do any? Do you need the city to do anything uh, with this application for the grant or no? In the email, it said that the city needs to uh, fill out the grant, and that's something that I think we will be working with Matt closely on to get that done. Right now, I think the, the big ticket item is to submit a letter of intent mm -hmm. for the grant by June 14th. So, and, and that's really what what we need to get this going. Uh, as I said, in the, or as it's written in the memo, um, we'll have uh, a more detailed budget at a later date when when it uh, gets closer to grant submission, which would be in December. Right. So, perfect. Yep. Great. <clears throat> Go ahead, Paul. John, I guess I was um, <clears throat> wondering what, what you had envisioned for your virtual walking tour is that like a video camera and you're walking down the street with it yeah i'm sorry um just to uh extrapolate a little bit on that um that was just something i was thinking about in my my drive home from work actually you know passing all these historic uh, buildings the the pavilion which i'm sure you've all noticed the the work on on the windows and uh, that's just a big shout out to all the the donors who made that happen and to our our past uh preservation commission everybody gave tirelessly to, to make sure that got done um but yeah i was thinking to have some sort of a, a video um where you, it's basically a walk by or you see that on a lot of real estate too i'm sure ian you've seen that yeah, you know can, where they do like I kind can. of a fly through something something on that nature i thought would be beneficial for anybody who has uh, a want to check out what's going on in columbus with all things historic and i can i have a lot of um, photographers that I work with that I can recommend to make that happen at a pretty good cost. So I can get you their info if that's something that the HLPC decides to do. In the yeah, future. if that's something that would uh, we'd want to do, I think I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. Anybody else? Perfect. So I think we have support for you to go ahead and put the letter of intent and get that moving, um, and then. Um, something that I've been talking with the HLPC for a long time and I'm super happy is on our agenda is the request to establish a facade grant. Go ahead, tell us more about that. Okay, so uh, the CDA already has the, their facade grant impro uh, imp improvement program um, in place and we would like to, uh, I think HLPC could augment that program um, focusing of course on the historic biz uh, buildings in, in the city. Um, I also think that there's pretty good potential for what I'll call legacy type donations. Um, something that, you know, people love the community and they love what the historic preservation group has done. And I think that a lot of people would like to uh, pass on maybe some of their estate or just some money to, to go towards a, a program like this where it's focused it's a laser focus on um, historic buildings and keeping the facades looking good. Um, one of the, the things that I would ask about that too, and I, I have to refer to my notes here because I've got a lot of things. Um, I guess I would like to ask the council for the ability uh, to award grants from CHLPC to be able to award those grants to those who meet the criteria, which we talked about a little bit ago. Um, as well as I'd like to ask if um, the council is okay with HLPC being able to use up any of its unused annual budgeted monies to go to this account. I, I have a, a question for you, John. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you think about the facade grant program, are you thinking about um, some of the historic buildings, especially downtown, um, 
you know, with all the talk of revitalizing the downtown, we have all those beautiful buildings. And oh, absolutely, like that. absolutely. Yeah. That's a great question, and um, but not not exclusively. You know, I think um, looking at privately owned homes, maybe not in the downtown. You know, there might be somebody who needs some assistance, um, somebody who has a great place, but they just ha don't have the money to fix it up. And if you know, there's good natured people who want to put money into this pool so that we can maybe help those people out. I think everybody wins. And that, and that's great. I guess I'm just sort of, <laughs> um, I'm, I would really like to see, um, just personally, you know, not as the mayor, but just personally would like to see maybe a little more emphasis put on the downtown area because I think there, there's so much wonderful raw material there and it would be so good for the city in in general um, to spiff it up a little bit. And so, it, it, you know, if this is something you're looking at, not just for private homes and for some of the, you know, the wonderful historic buildings, but also some of those downtown areas, I would be all in favor of that. I think that's Oh, yeah. A, and, yeah. and I don't want to scare you away thinking that it would be, you know, private homes because, I mean, you look at our, our historic districts. We have four historic districts in the city now. And three of them all dovetail into the downtown, so that would that would be a no-brainer. Okay. Do you have uh, applications and parameters already set up, or is that yet to be determined? Yeah. If you oh. refer to your packet, there was I think Matt forwarded those to you. They did. Yep. No, and it, what's what's great is it, it mirrors and uh, the program that they've already got going, so that a lot of the things look similar. So if you've seen them before. They, it's going to look familiar. So my other question was, you, you mentioned that you wanted to take budget monies that were left over. Yeah, um, typically, I think right now we get $3,000 a year annual budgeted monies. Um, I, I can't speak to how, how exhausted those budget funds are every year, um, but if I just thought if there's $500 left over in our budget at the end of the year, it would be nice to to build into this this program. I mean, right now we don't have any designated funds set aside for it, but I want to have that ability or have an account so that if people, if somebody wants to make a donation exclusively to the facade improvement program, they can do that. But I also thought if if there's happens to be leftover money um, from our budgeted uh, funds, why not be able to put that in there, which goes to the collective. I don't know, according to accounting, yeah, if you can. Um, it's not GAP standards. It would be what uh, GAP? Uh, yeah, so I, I think there's ways to do it. It was you know, brought up during the conversation, but um, in, in talking uh, with, with Ian and the mayor, um, I think that's a good discussion mm -hmm. for budget time mm -hmm. uh, because it, it falls in the general fund. And so just like public works, when they don't spend their budget, the next year they start over from zero and they get that next year's allocation. There's no buildup unless the, the council intentionally reserves something. If we wanted to set it up, I would set it up more likely as a fund that could build fund balance. So any unexpended funds stay within the fund and you could use previous year's contributions or reserves to come into a future year for funding larger things. So I, I think it's more of a budget time discussion on if that's how you'd like to do it. Uh, because keeping it in the general fund, but also trying to have that fund balance built from within the general fund is kind of a strange uh -huh. setup. So I would prefer to do it more as a, a separate fund, most likely. So w would it be easier? I know with a lot of the restricted funds that I work with, um, they'll make a move on a monthly basis where they take money from the general fund and put it into the restricted fund as opposed to waiting to the end of the year for a possible, you know, oops, yay. Um, so perhaps when we get to budgeting, it would make more sense to have you set aside funds to put in that restricted fund every month, assuming that that gets passed. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of ways that we could talk about it. I, I don't think now is the time, I think, during budget season and figuring it out as we go forward. For now, we just want to, like, I think the grant program's awesome, and I want to get that moving. Um, and then things of that nature, 
when budget season comes around, we can start figuring out stuff. You bet. I just, you know, always try to be as as, as transparent as I can be and throw things out right away so that when budget time comes around, if I say, what about this? And you guys are like, you know, I'll ticked off or anything so no i and i totally appreciate that it's good to keep people aware and of what you're intending to do and what you would like to do um you guys do so much for our community and i really appreciate it so anything that we can do to help and discuss for other things is always awesome um did anyone else have any questions or concerns comments about the facade grant program i just have a quick question um i'm new to this whole whatever historic stuff do you do like uh funding or like different things to 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 earn money for this stuff throughout yeah. the year hey, so that's, that people can donate that's a great question um and it, it's nice to meet you shelly i see yeah. right shelly yeah. yeah um yeah we do uh historically boom <laughs> uh, right right um <laughs> we we've had um summer concert series where we uh have it's more of a community gathering um where we'll have a uh, local bands or artists right. come to the fireman's park it's about fellowship and putting names and faces together so that you know when you see me walking down the street with a cup of coffee you blow the horn and say hey john you know it's just putting people together you know it's a pretty small city we live in um but yeah to answer your question we've done things like that the summer concert series and I'm just thinking back, Alice Schmidt used to do these soup luncheons and all this stuff, and, you know, she was a great matriarch for the group. Um, so, yeah, we have, and we've also been really, really fortunate to have um, been the benefactors of some sizable, sizable uh, donations here in, in the past uh, several years, the past five years for sure. Good. All right, thank you. For, this is kind of uh, for Paul. Um, we, Paul and I talked about uh, how to do this in a way that, I guess, provides some transparency, but also it's kind of uh, murky when you look at the ordinance, what, what kind of authority they would have to do a grant. So the preferred way to do this would do pass a resolution basically granting the authority to carry out the, um, their uh, uh, grant program as shown in their application form. So I, I think Paul would need to, for the next meeting, grant, uh, develop some sort of resolution. Um, and Paul, I guess I just, would you uh, elaborate on that a little bit, please? Well, I can. The, uh, the ordinances that the city has for the uh, HLPC uh, allows the HLPC to fundraise all at once which is a very good thing. Unfortunately, the HLPC is not allowed to spend any of the money that it raises without city approval. Um, so it creates a very complicated process when it comes down to doing projects like this or like renovations to the pavilion. Um, so I think that the way to, that you can work around that if you so choose um, is for the city council to delegate some of its authority to the HLPC. Um, and the question for the council will then become exactly how far do you want that delegation to extend. Um, but for the facade program, it, it seems to me that uh, if there is X amount of dollars that HLPC is uh, fundraising or has set aside for this program, and it's developed criteria and the application process is in your packet and there's a set process for doing this, the council could go so far as to say, uh, HLPC, you have the direct authority to uh, spend, spend the money and grant the grants uh, however you wish. Um, if the council's not comfortable going quite that far and you want to put like a dollar amount on it or uh, some kind of a review process that's up for you to decide. But the resolution that Matt is referring to is something along the lines of, uh, we are giving HLPC this authority, here's the extent of the authority, and then we can go from there. So it, it's, it's just a, it, it kind of is, is dotting I's and crossing T's so that everybody knows what's going on maintain the transparency and it 
gives the HRTC independent authority to do something. Right. And I, I think that would be the easiest way because otherwise every time, it, well, and who knows how popular the program will be. Hopefully it is. Otherwise, every time a resident or a business owner applies for a grant, it has to come in front of us for approval, and that would take it a minimum of a month plus to get through everything. So it would really slow down the process, and we're not talking about a whole bunch of money into any individual thing or a corrupt entity giving money. It's you know raised funds, it's donated funds going to another donated entity to improve our community. So I personally would be perfectly comfortable moving, having Paul draft a resolution for the next meeting. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree. I think it's kind of a waste time for people to have to come through to the council to do, and I don't know what we're talking. Are we talking small dollar amounts like $5,000, $10,000? Uh, in the... So in my only um, input on that is if it can be audited, you know, with the you guys spend the money and then you submit like an expense report with all your receipts and your documentation that it can be audited, I think that would be perfectly fine. Yeah, and I'll just say this too, that uh, we have a audit done every year for all of our, our book work. So that's, that's all right. available for anybody to check out. Right, I mean, and that's just transparency, making sure your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> I agree. I, I think it would be fine f to give the HLPC some um, autonomy with uh, giving out uh, some facade grant money right. for sure rather than it coming in front of us every time, for sure. Right. And, and we're talking about just for, it, at least in my mind, we're talking about just for this specific facade grant program. If the HLPC wants to create more grants or something in the future and do more, that's awesome. But at that point, I think we should all talk about that again and grant authority for that separately but yeah but I, I think each of these should be done separately and my my question for I guess the, the main question that I have right now in preparation for the resolution is do you want to put a dollar cap on any individual grant or do you want to simply leave it to HLPC to manage the funds as they deal with those um, well, John, what are your thoughts on a dollar amount? Like, you have specific amounts in the um, proposal for the in things. Is that kind of where you're feeling that's safe at? And if you want to, I do. I do. More, um, it later. I, I don't. Without really knowing how how great this can grow, it, it's really kind of a guess right now. I I think having a, if it makes you guys feel more comfortable to have some sort of a cap or a, a limit. I think that's fine. Um, uh, I, I think that our track record's pretty well proven too. That you know we've we've gotten a lot a lot of money donated, and you know we can show where it all went, and we were, we uh, <laughs> we do what we say we're, we're going to do. Right. So I, I think yeah. we we spend money responsibly. Sorry, sometimes yeah. I'm not the best yeah. with the words, but I think we've we have a proven track record of uh, fiscal responsibility. Right. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I think maybe to keep things in the spirit of what it is for now, maybe we put a, a cap on it, and then because if it starts getting to large amounts, maybe then it is a different morphing into something new that we should talk about again. I think so. we should put a cap on it. It's not about um, your track record because I'm sure it's been wonderful, but it's about good internal controls for the city and setting precedent for other committees as well. Yeah. Is there, like, because, of course, Attorney Johnson's going to need some direction to write this resolution. Is, does anyone, or do you have a number that you think we should cap at? I think 5,000 is a good number. I think everybody can agree that you can do a, a lot with 5,000, but you can't do too much. Right. You know, it's, it's a safe amount. Yeah. I think that everybody could agree on. Okay, perfect. That's honestly the number, magic number that was in my head, so you'd be good at guessing numbers. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, apparently I'm not good at guessing numbers. I had 15,000 in my head, but... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that... You, you got the five part, right? <laughs> right. I support 5,000 as well. I, I think the city purchasing policy is up to 10,000. So if we want to be consistent with that, because I know 
I can't remember what I was working on recently if it was, uh, but that's how we amend it, or that's what, oh, CDA bylaws, which we have a draft of. Um, we changed it to be consistent with purchasing policy, so. Okay, that's well all. then that that totally makes sense. This just then too, I guess with the, the cost of uh, building materials skyrocketing too, that's probably, it makes more sense to go with 10. Uh, if it, bigger than normal. Yeah. And right. I mean, at least at first, you're probably not gonna be giving anything anywhere near that anyway, but yeah, I mean, to keep it uniform across the board, 10,000 makes sense to yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I think we have consensus. You feel good on that, Attorney Johnson, to move forward with that? I have enough to at least get started and have something for you next week. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, too, for being here. Yep. It's good seeing you both. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have um, Kyle's going to talk to us a bit about the twenty two the twenty twenty two budget process. All right. Uh, it's uh, budget time already. We were actually just talking about right. uh, things and and how we're going to deal with them during the the budget cycle. And as I look at it, really the beginning is is already here. Um, uh, department heads are already kind of piecing together things that they think they're going to be requesting in a few months. And so this is similar to last year's kind of layout where, um, you know, starting uh, this month, uh, we're just a little bit ahead of last year, but this month uh, we adopt the procedure and timeline so everyone knows kind of what the expectations are um, in July. Uh, either uh, July 20th uh, would be a regular meeting, I believe, uh, but if there's a desire for special meetings too, um, the, the city council really should be communicating then uh, kind of their goals and any projects or initiatives or reallocations, reductions, reserves, all those things kind of the wish list early on, um, trying to communicate that to the administrator so I can work with the department heads to put that into um, a budget as we start to formulate it. Um, in August, the department heads would have to have um, their requested budgets due to me, and then by September, we're still getting numbers at that point from the state and from health insurance and from other places. Uh, but it is starting to firm up in September and then in, uh, into October, um, you know, basically from September 21st, you're going to see that budget at every meeting. Um, and so you'll see the October 5th, um, which would be the version from the 21st of any changes uh, suggested by the mayor and council. And then uh, if there's any other changes, uh, those could be incorporated uh, prior to October 19th, uh, which is when we would be hoping to uh, approve the proposed 2022 budget for publishing. Um, the important part to note there is that you have to have uh, it published 15 days ahead of the public hearing. So that would bump it back likely to November 16th for the actual public hearing. And anywhere up to the point you vote to adopt, you can change those numbers um, before you, or when you adopt the budget. Uh, but you should be close so that people have a reasonable expectation of what the budget's gonna look like. Uh, but if you need to change one line or change something, it can still be done all the way till you vote to approve it, even if you publish something different. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, gives us a fallback of November 23rd as well, uh, that if there was anything at the uh, budget hearing that we wanted to change or was more substantial, we would still have time to get it there, uh, get it approved, and then starts the process of tax bill generation and uh, kind of setting the tax roll uh, with the county treasurer and getting tax bills prepared and out uh, at a reasonable time in December. Uh, so uh, that's what I had laid out, um, uh, but open to uh, questions and, and comments uh, on what anyone else might like to see. Um, Kyle, I have a question. So is 2021 uh, audited? Did you, is Baker Tilly done with financial statements from last year? Uh, they have not issued the draft financial statements yet. Okay. So when is your ETA on that? Um, I saw a, uh, an invoice come in recently, so I don't know how many things are outstanding right now. I can check with the interim finance director and see, um, you know, what they're waiting on. Uh, last year it was late May, I think, when they first delivered them. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't come present them until later in summer. Okay. It's just uh, I'm in the habit of you know going back, looking at history when I when I look at budgets and whatnot. So, did anybody else have any questions or thoughts on anything for Kyle? Okay, 
otherwise everything I I mean I know I'm the only one that was here prior to Kyle helping us with this process but trust me it's amazing and I am very very happy that it's been so much more streamlined with you here thank you um, so I think we should be good on that next up is review and consider alcohol license renewals um, for 2021 to 2022 in all the separate classes. Notice there's a couple, there's one in here that's a little past due, but it's $11 for pick and save. I don't, personally don't feel a need to hold anything up on that. Um, my only, I suppose this is first for most of us, uh, for most of you like going through alcohol licenses and things. My only thought is this seemed, always seemed to me a little bit um, laborsome, like it didn't really need to come to the council, especially when the renewals, maybe a new license, like is there anything that we would need to do or change in order for like Pat to just, if there's nothing wrong with it, it gets approved and it's renewed. Because I don't, I personally, unless everybody likes reviewing liquor renewals one by one for every business in the town of Columbus, like, so uh, in my experience, in other communities that I've dealt uh, uh, dealt with or worked in, uh, they've not typically gone uh, license by license. They've kind of batched them together, and you know, almost similar to the claims package. Right. If you have questions or if there's anything, if there's one that doesn't uh, have everything checked off, maybe those get set aside for separate discussion. Uh, but I do often see other communities treat them in batches for expediency. There's a philosophical argument whether or not you should pass them off so lightly, uh, but many of these are established businesses that have recurring licenses, and uh, you know, so it is a judgment call. Right. So maybe I think that's more of a something to discuss than the licenses themselves. Honestly, does anyone have any thoughts on like kind of bat and putting them all together? And in unless there's outliers, like I mean, in this situation, pick and save would should be called out even though I think we should still move forward with it because it's $11 and I'm sure they're going to pay their bill. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? I, I just have a question because I, <clears throat> I noticed that on one of the um, applications, somebody owes $893 to the water and light utility. So is that something that we should be concerned about? Mm -hmm. I mean, does that... And then I guess since this is the first time I think I've done this, do we... Uh, um, is there like criteria that we use for deciding whether or not we're gonna yeah, a renew big, or not? Yeah, so. well, I suppose probably Pat. Can yeah, Pat. That, but, Johnson's also oh, between. oh, Attorney Johnson. <laughs> good, good evening. Uh, historically, the city council has worked through these license applications one by one in painstaking detail. Mm -hmm. um, over the last couple of years, uh, Pat uh, Gable has done a really good job of streamlining this process to get to what you are looking at tonight, which is basically uh, sheets that show all of the inspections are done. Uh, and if there are a couple outliers that have, that have little things that need to be uh, addressed, uh, they're easily identifiable. Uh, as far as your standards go for the application, because all of these are renewals, um, the application process, the standards are, are uh, a lot less to deal with because they have a right to their license, basically. Um, what you should be looking at uh, are, are there inspection issues that need to be dealt with? Are there past due amounts that need to be cleared up before the license is issued? And probably the most important one is the definition of the premises. Um, mm -hmm. in, in past years, we've spent a considerable amount of time trying to get the premises definition for each place uh, down and accurate. Um, and if the premises application is the same this year as it was last year, that's a really good thing. And those are kind of the three biggest issues <clears throat> to look at. Otherwise, there's really not a whole lot that needs to be, uh, there's not a lot of controversy in this year's applications. 
Thank you, Attorney Johnson. Yeah, and I, I would like to thank Pat for all the work that she does on this. It was, I mean, I don't want to sound like a whiner, but like when I first got on council, this was arduous, <laughs> like going through each and every individual, like it was intense. And this is a lot better. I think, it, but in my opinion, like renewals, maybe new applications we should look on at an individual basis, but I think renewals, and Pat's already put all this together, showed us who's in compliance with everything. I think batching them together, in my opinion, just, and then taking out the outliers that there is something to look at. Otherwise, if the description's the same, they've met all the requirements, just batch them. And Paul? I guess I have one question um, regarding the, I'm not sure what the phrase was, um, the definition of the property, um, is that, Audited or is that looked at like from the inspector as well? Like you know, okay, because I, I'm just saying, just if it, if it was this last year, then you know they moved over two two aisles and they're increasing it. Somebody should catch that. So I'm good. Yep, and it can lead to very lengthy conversations at council. Um, Different licenses can. It, it, you'd be amazed. Yeah. All right. But Pat's have done a great job, and so does everyone else support going to more of that? What, are you, do you have any thoughts on it, Pat, at all, of, or concerns if we did that? Uh, no, I, as long as is what I presented works for you, um, I can say that, you know, the, the, what Paul it, uh, mentioned was the premise descriptions, and both Pauls, for that matter, uh, they are they are reviewed by mm -hmm. the inspector building inspector and if they are vastly different from the year before we take a closer look at that we don't really see that this year right. their descriptions are slightly different but it they haven't changed in moving it from this person this place to five feet over to the next we don't see that we're not right. seeing that we didn't see that in any of the in inspections so you know what what you see is you know is what we've received and right. we we're happy with that right awesome thank you yeah i'd be in support of an established business that's just renewing their license you know batching that together and, and then if there's anything that sticks out yeah and then doing renewal or i mean new uh, applications obviously yeah coming through but yep i can support that Okay, perfect. I'd and and I appreciate your clarification for <laughs> those of us who are new about how it used to be compared to what it is now. That's yeah. very helpful to yeah. know. Thanks. Yeah, I, I remember it taking multiple, multiple meetings to get through. Like, it was months of liquor licenses, <laughs> and it seemed like we got no business done but liquor licenses. It was not fun. I also just did want to add that <clears throat> we are required to publish a list of all applications and that has been done, that's been taken care of, and that has to be done a certain amount of uh, days before the licenses are granted. So we're in line with that, and if this moves forward to the 22nd, then we'll be, that, that will be set, and we'll have licenses ready for the folks to pick up before the end of the month. Okay, awesome, thank you. So I have a quick question. So there's a few people that are waiting until July to pay their t the rest of their tax bill. Are you considering that an exception or not? So I think one of the big things, like when, at least how we handled things like that before, is if they had, if they had an established agreement with, like say they were past due on utilities or tax, like if they had an agreement and they were working toward it, then we considered they were paying it. If they didn't, then they would, they needed to get an agreement is kind of how councils handled it in the past. Well, and, and if they're paying the second half by the due date, mm -hmm. Then it's going. fine. Right. That's yeah. that so was my point in bringing really, it up. Yeah, so then, how do we know that the people that owe the eight hundred and some dollars to Water and Light do they have an agreement? I guess I didn't see well, that on here. I didn't see that. I can. What I would do is get direction from you, or I would follow through on that, and that would be the update that would come forward at the next meeting mm -hmm. that this has been taken care of, or they have an agreement in place with the Water and Light, and I would have, um, you know, inform. I would have. Um, that information from the water and light verifying that. Okay, and I think I think that makes sense then. Yeah. And I think yeah. in the past it's been sometimes, if like for example, the smaller ones, um, it, you know, approved contingent upon this is paid by this time or, you know, that kind of language right. you could use. Yeah. 
just as everyone kind of in agreement, maybe if it would would you be able to reach out to Cardinal Cage in time? Do you think to yes. make sure? And then as long as they have. Okay, perfect. And then we could, so then at the next meeting, we could decide to approve Cardinal Cage based on the information that we have, along with everything else, or not approve it and only approve the others and kind of talk about it when we have more info on it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. And Paul, did you have something? <laughs> yes, I, I just, I'm just curious. We Obviously, we've been doing this way for a reason. Is, is there anything that, um, in the ordinance that says we have to do them individually, or do we have to look at that, or...? I think it was more of just a control thing and refining some of them. It was kind of a mess for a while. Like it, and it's hard to like. I mean, Pat can speak to it a lot more because she's done a lot of work getting this cleaned up and streamlining it for us. And how much work she put into this already. Like basically, these are forms telling us that everything is good, you know, except for maybe the cardinal cage. Like, so I I think that's there isn't really a need to go through them like there used once was i think is kind of so i suppose thank you for bringing that up like i didn't give enough history on that i don't think i don't see a need to go through it anymore one by one and ascertain all this information because pat's done it like it's good to go we aren't going to discover anything more sitting up here on council than what pat's already put into it if that makes sense you know pat could you just send No, no problem. Yeah, but that is that. Yeah, I agree. That's a that's a large amount, so we should look at that further before we approve. So, awesome. Any other thoughts or comments on liquor licenses? Um, there are a few things that we've looked into, and that just still shows on there that it's not posted. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, that was my error. We did contact them to make sure it was posted. We did get a picture of it posted. We okay. did have someone see that it was posted. That is uh, a requirement by law. You have to post your license. She brought it with her to apply for her license, not knowing she didn't really need to do that, and evidently didn't get posted again. But it's fine, they're okay on that part of it. Good. So I'll make these corrections as they before we come forward next next meeting. Perfect. Thank you so much. Then if there's nothing else on that, we get to talk about tobacco uh, licenses next. So that is, so basically this is just a approving the tobacco and cigarette licenses for the businesses listed everyone should have a list of them basically it looks like the for the most part um, uh, gas stations and um, things of that nature anybody have any concerns or anything about renewing the tobacco licenses okay cool that should be good and then we can move that forward then next up is to convene to close session per 19.851G to confer with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is or is likely to become involved. Um, do I have a motion to move into closed session for the reasons read? Alder Piper will make a motion to, re to convene into closed session. For the reason read. Okay, seconds. Awesome. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. We got oh, roll, roll call. Sorry. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Let's see. <coughs> Just a minute. I got to make a note. Okay. Arnold? Aye. Gray? Aye. McCabe? Aye. Motive? Aye. Piperone? Aye. Um, Albright? Aye. Motion carries. Awesome. Then we are convening to close session and we will not be coming back on the air tonight. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>